Welcome to Couples Therapy. I'm Jeff Saunders. I've been a couples therapist for about 15 years and counsellor for about as long again before that. And so I work with couples most days. And I want to talk to you a little bit about couples therapy because couples therapy is hard work for clients and is very, very different than standard psychotherapy or counselling, both of which I've done. I want to alert you to the fact that couples work is difficult and I want to alert you as to why. But first of all, I want to start off by saying being in a relationship is difficult for almost everybody. And it's difficult for similar reasons for everybody, but of course most people don't know that everyone else is struggling for the similar reasons. And one of the one of the problems is that the dynamics of couples' uh, behaviour, interaction, is invisible to them. I mean, they might know they get angry and they might know that they say unpleasant things, but they really don't know. Most couples have got no idea what triggers that. So let me just go back a step or two. I'm sitting in on the couch here which my couples usually sit in. And it's comfortable talking about couples, but it's much, much harder being one sitting in front of me because there's so much shame involved, embarrassment. None of us want to fail. None of us want to be in difficulty. None of us want to be to our partner something we don't want to be. None of us want to feel like we're behaving in a way that is less than ideal. But most of us in a relationship know that some of the time that's exactly what we do. <clears throat> Let me tell you why. The origin of our couple's behaviour did not start with the person that we're now with. It started in childhood. I'm sure you may know some of this, but fundamentally what happens in childhood is children are trained to relate in particular ways. They're trained in the school that they're most familiar with and they see daily, their own home. So by the age of 10, if I see a child of 10 and watch their dynamics with their friends, I can pretty much tell you what they're going to be like with a partner. It's true that there are some other stresses and strains that happen after, say, the age of 10. For example, we might have a first relationship that was very painful, which gets us more guarded or something like that. <clears throat> but the truth is, we're really programmed from very early on to behave in a certain way. And I'm in the process of preparing some courses to go online because I can't really help couples on the planet two by two. In fact, even my own city two by two is a little slow. <clears throat> so I'm working out ways to try and hasten my impact. So I've thought that putting couple stuff online might be a way that people can get their head around some of the dynamics. What is really surprising is that I consider that there are six factors that play a role in the way couples interact. I call them drivers. I call them six drivers. So when, for example, your partner says, oh, I don't like the way you're doing such and such, fundamentally, about three or four drivers are going to kick in and respond. But virtually no one knows what they are. How can you fix what you don't understand is broken or why it's broken. You know something's going wrong, but how can you possibly fix that when it's an invisible problem? Let me give you the first driver, and the first driver affects all the others, pretty much. The first driver is called attachment patterns. Attachment patterns were identified in the 50s and 60s by, first of all, John Bowlby, then his student, Mary Ainsworth, did a lot of research on one-year-olds 
and she coined virtually certain terms in regards to how those one-year-olds interacted with their peers and with others, particularly their peers. And those attachment terms I will talk about in another session, but those attachment patterns are fundamentally skewed according to gender. So basically most males have a certain way of behaving and most females have a certain way of behaving in relationship. In my view it's about 90% to 95% are gender specific patterns. But what can happen in a relationship is those patterns can change largely because people have to be guarded, people don't want to say things, people don't want to raise a problem and all this sort of thing. So what happens is people close down in relationship or say less or are very, very careful not to rock the boat. And so what happens is a person who was naturally, say, quite connecting, enjoyed people, enjoyed engaging with people, may become quite guarded in a relationship. Now, that sort of person is most likely, I'm describing, a woman. What men are likely to do is underdo the connection in general in relationship. They tend to be more distant, more withdrawn, they get focused on jobs, business, work, fixing the spouting, doing this and doing that. And that's the way they contribute. They contribute to a relationship by trying to make sure that things are shipshape. And usually, in most cases, trying to bring in some money. So in many ways what happens when couples get together, they are wired to focus on different things. Generally speaking, most women are wired to connect. I call those types of people connectors. So when a person is a connector, mostly likely a woman, they're going to prioritize relationships, closeness, talking things out, being with people they like, caring for people who are in trouble. So what happens is they tend to get anxious about relationships that are not good, not balanced, not happy. Most men, however, are busy getting anxious about bringing the money, paying the bills, getting things fixed and sorted. So we come into a relationship with different expectations, we have come with different intentions, we come with different wiring, we're wired differently. We're not wired badly, although there are strengths and weaknesses in all styles of wiring. But fundamentally the difficulty is, no one told us when we got into a relationship with a person that actually they could well be wired a completely different way than you and it might take you a while to work that out. And also, if they're wired differently, that means they might relate to you in a way that you're not very happy with. Now, this is not just a gender thing. When I work with gay couples, usually, in fact, all that I've worked with, they have been, and male and female, there is one person wired to want to focus on connection, and there's one wanting to focus on getting the spouting fixed. So, we're wired these different ways which really gets us into trouble because when we argue, when we have different viewpoints, instead of trying to listen to a different viewpoint and accommodate it or get our heads around it, what most of us do is what we did in childhood, is to get anxious that our needs are met, anxious that things are done the way we like, anxious that things are done in the way we thought they should be. What virtually, well, very, very few people are good at is really listening to two different viewpoints and accommodating two different viewpoints. I'll be talking about this a lot more later. But first of all, I want to get you to understand we're in relationship because we love a person. The irony is we frequently love the way they're different and then the way they're different drives us up the wall. So we do have a problem. We have a significant problem. We're getting driven up the wall by somebody we were liked because they were different 
and we rather like that difference. And now we're struggling with the difference. We don't quite know how to address the difference. And here's the other thing. What happens when we get into trouble in a relationship? We then go into emotional reactivity. Now, some of you will know you get emotionally reactive. Others have got little idea. In fact, if I say to a person, so what do you feel when such and such happens? Usually, the people who connect, mostly the women, know quite a lot of what they feel. Frequently, the men <coughs> know very little of what they feel. They may know they get angry. They know, may know they get worked up. But they usually don't know that there's a whole raft of emotions going on that they were never raised to be aware of. And no one usually in their families talked about them, about it. The reason I think women tend to often know what they're, talk, what they're feeling is because they do talk about it. They often talk about it with each other and they're far better wired emotionally than most men are. So I call them men who have this standard male pen with drawers and the women who have the standard desire to connect and relate I call connectors. Now this is a very very important difference. In the honeymoon period that difference is barely visible because in the honeymoon period everyone loves everybody and so they're wanting to meet, greet, do nice things together, be agreeable, be patient, listen to the other. They've got all these very, very good social skills at that time of life, which unfortunately don't always last very long. They can be recovered, but what happens in relationships is tensions build up for all sorts of reasons. Children, work that has to be done, just the tiredness at the end of the day. And then what happens, sadly, is that things go pear-shaped. Things go downhill because people can't get their needs met. They can't be understood. They often don't know exactly how to be understood. What happens also, for women especially, particularly the connector woman, is they can frequently go into disempowerment. Now, most males, most withdrawers, don't know that that's happening. Actually, until I tell most women that I'm working with, they don't know it's happening either. But most of them, when I talk about it, actually recognize that that is exactly what's happening. So this is an introductory, this is an introductory little short session to get you to understand that I'm going to do a series of these. This is number one of a series. And I'm going to start introducing some of the dynamics that actually happen with couples. But I don't want to, to rush it. You can go on my website, couplescounselingforyou.co.nz and actually you'll find a number of articles I've written there. If you want to get ahead of the game, read the article I've put there called Conflict Styles. Conflict Styles. So the conflict styles talk to you about these different wiring patterns. They're not gender specific, they're gender skewed. That's important difference. And the truth is, until you read that or buy the book on Amazon or something, um, the book, the Successful Couples Recipe Book, well, a couple of my clients called my book a recipe book, uh, and I thought, well, that's a good title for it. So in those days, the book was called Successful Couples. Now it's called the Successful Couples Recipe Book. So I want to let you know that I will be doing a series of these videos and I'll be leading onto a course where I outline in detail. The first course of, I'll have more than one, the first course I'm going to be doing is 20 sessions. 
20 sessions, probably about half to 40, half an hour, 40 minutes each. But you'll really get to understand the dynamics. You will not learn about, I don't think, anywhere else. I've been trained as a counsellor in this field for some time, and I have never ever met a counsellor or a training that covers all the points I do. It's basically just having seen hundreds and hundreds, actually a couple of thousand couples in the last 15 years that's got me to learn these patterns and articulate them and write them down. So best of luck, I'll come back with the second video in a, in a wee while. All the best, happy reading if you get to my website. Cheers.